There are lots of opportunistic infections that can cause disease in all parts of the body. Committing them to memory can be an overwhelming task. Just like with all of your learning for step one, I encourage you to organize the infections in different ways to learn this material best. Be creative with your learning. And as always, as always, repetition, repetition, repetition is the key to adult learning. Repetition is the key to adult learning. For this video, I will organize the infections based on the CD4 count. As more CD4 cells are killed and the numbers decrease, the greater number of infections are possible. This makes sense. As we lose our bodyguards, we start to be more susceptible to different infections that otherwise would really not be a problem. The important CD4 counts to remember are 500, 200, and 100 cells per millimeters cubed. 5, 2, and 1. At each of these checkpoints, you need to start thinking of different opportunistic infections. At 500 CD4 cells per millimeters cubed, the four important pathogens are Canada albicans, the Epstein-Barr virus, human herpes virus 8, and human papillomavirus. These are three viruses and one fungus. Can you remember how Canada albicans typically presents? Well, remember, Canada is a fungus and it typically presents as oral thrush. Oral thrush is a fungal infection of the oral cavity. The key clinical exam finding is a scrapable white plaque on the tongue. When looked at under the microscope, we will see characteristic pseudohyphae, significant for Canada. Epstein-Barr virus will cause a disease that appears quite similar to oral thrush. This is called oral hairy leukoplakia. Do you remember the key way to distinguish between this and oral thrush? Well, hairy leukoplakia is an unscrapable white lesion. It's generally found on the lateral aspect of the tongue. So the key here is that it's unscrapable in comparison to Canada oral thrush, which would cause a scrapable white plaque. Human herpes virus 8 causes the infamous lesions seen in AIDS patients called Kaposi sarcoma. Do you remember what these are? Kaposi sarcoma is a dark, violaceous nodule that represents HHE viral infection of endothelial cells. They cause vascular proliferations that are most commonly found on the external skin, but they also can be seen in the gastrointestinal tract and in the lung. On biopsy, we will see lymphocytic inflammation. Here is a classic image of a Kaposi sarcoma on the skin. Human papillomavirus is an oncovirus, and in the immunosuppressed can lead to squamous cell carcinoma of the anus or of the cervix. It can also cause this in immunocompetent folks, but it will cause more significant carcinoma in folks that are immunocompromised. The next important CD4 count or level is 200 cells per millimeters cubed. Four pathogens in this group are important to know. This includes the human immunodeficiency virus, the JC virus, pneumocystis gyrovicii, and histoplasma capsulatum. Wait, doesn't HIV virus cause AIDS? What do you mean that it can also be an opportunistic infection? Well, yes, it's, it's quite interesting. HIV virus does cause AIDS, but remember, it is a virus that can also infect other cells in addition to the CD4 cell. Once the immunity wanes to less than 200 CD4 cells per millimeter cubed, the HIV virus can, unfortunately, cause pretty significant dementia. This dementia is chronic, slowly develops, it's insidious, but it can be quickly devastating. The JC virus can lead to a progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Do you remember what that is again? It is a central nervous system demyelinating disease. The virus infects and destroys oligodendrocytes, the cells that are responsible for making myelin in the central nervous system. This usually is a fatal disease, and it is diagnosed by an MRI, which shows non-enhancing areas of demyelination diffusely throughout the central nervous system. Now, do you remember what kind of virus the JC virus is? Very good, it is a polyomavirus. It is a polyomavirus, one of the non-enveloped DNA viruses. Do you remember the other important polyomavirus? The BK virus, very good. You can remember that the two viruses in the polyomavirus family are uh, shorthand just two letters, two letter viral names. 
Pneumocystis gerevechii can lead to pneumocystis pneumonia. On chest x-ray, we see ground glass opacities that we can see here in the bases of this chest x-ray. It's hard to really imagine here, but what we see is sort of these nodular ground glass rough appearing lung that is infected by the pneumocystis. Do you remember an important medication that we can give as prophylaxis against pneumocystis infection? Yes, we can give trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole as prophylaxis against pneumocystis infection when the CD4 count gets to less than 200. Histoplasma capsulatum is a fungus that can cause disseminated fungal infection in the immunocompromised, called histoplasmosis. Now do you remember where in the United States this fungus is endemic? In the Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys. Very good. This infection leads to several nonspecific symptoms, such as fever, fatigue, weight loss, cough, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. If you were to take a biopsy specimen of an area infected with histoplasma, you would see oval yeast cells with macrophages. That is the key finding. So once our patient gets to having only 100 CD4 cells per millimeter cubed, things start to really get ugly. In this state, patients can experience diseases caused by several organisms as you can see listed here. You can see that most of them are fungus. Some of them are viruses and then there's a mycobacteria. As I mentioned previously, in a healthy patient, our immune system would take care of these infectious agents and everything would be fine. But in these patients, these organisms make life pretty miserable. Aspergillus is a fungi that likes to infect the lungs. It likes to make big cavities within the lung and causes often hemoptysis as well as pleuritic chest pain. The key thing is we find cavitation or infiltrates on chest imaging. A very serious and life-threatening infection in AIDS is cryptococcal neoformans causing cryptococcal meningitis. Do you remember the classic symptoms of meningitis? Fever, headache, neutral rigidity, and photophobia. Very good. Cryptococcal meningitis can be diagnosed with CSF fluid sampling via a spinal tap. Do you remember what you'd see on your CSF fluid? You'd see thickly encapsulated yeast on India ink stain. Now how would you treat cryptococcal meningitis? You'd give amphotericin B and flucytosine. Very good. Now for Canada albicans, do you remember what infection you would see in patients with a CD4 count of around 500 or between 200 and 500? Yeah, you'd see oral thrush. Very good. Now, how about in folks that have CD4 counts of less than 100? What do you see? Well, as the AIDS advances and the CD4 count further decreases, Canada can infect other parts of the body. It can cause particularly important esophagitis. You can think about the Canada progressing past the oral cavity where it causes thrush and into the esophagus where it's causing esophagitis. On endoscopy, you'll see white plaques similarly to what you see in the oral cavity. You would see that pseudohyphae on your biopsy specimen. Cytomegalovirus, or CMV, is one of the worst pathogens for patients with AIDS. This little guy can end up all over the place. It can cause retinitis, esophagitis, colitis, pneumonitis, cephalitis. It's really a horrible, horrible virus. Some classic findings include linear ulcers in the esophagus sound found on endoscopy, as well as cotton wool spots on fundoscopy, uh, looking in the eye. The classic finding on biopsy includes owl eye inclusion bodies. You'll see owl eye inclusion bodies on the biopsy specimen. Epstein-Barr virus can cause a B-cell lymphoma, which can either manifest as a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or a CNS lymphoma. If you hear the words CNS lymphoma in a patient with AIDS, the lymphoma is likely caused by EBV infection, nine times out of 10. It's a solitary ring-enhancing lesion seen on MRI or CT scan. Bartonella henselii is a zoonosis or an infectious disease transmitted by animals to humans. In this case, it is transmitted from cats to humans and it can cause a bacillary angiomatosis. In this case, we would see a biopsy with neutrophilic inflammation. Mycobacterium avium intracellular is a mycobacteria that is very common in patients with AIDS. Do you remember what we used to prevent this mycobacterial infection? We can give azithromycin or rifibutin. Very good. 
This mycobacteria causes nonspecific symptoms such as fever, night sweats, weight loss, as well as a focal lymphadenitis or infection and inflammation of the lymph nodes. Toxoplasma gondii is a protozoa that loves the central nervous system. It is found in different uncooked meats. In AIDS, this protozoa will present as multiple brain abscesses. It's pretty devastating. You'll find ring-enhancing lesions on the MR. Cryptosporidium is another protozoa that loves the gastrointestinal tract in patients with AIDS. It causes a pretty devastating and miserable chronic watery diarrhea. In immunocompetent people, protozoal diarrhea is mild and self-limiting, but in AIDS patients with CD4 counts less than 100, it causes a chronic, fairly severe diarrhea. It is diagnosed by seeing oocysts or acid-fast oocysts in the stool when the diarrhea is sampled.